Welcome to the SJ Child Show, where a little bit of knowledge can turn fear into understanding. Enjoy the show. Hello, and thank you for joining the SJ Child Show. I apologize for my voice as I am just have a cold, unfortunately, but I wanted to get this episode out so that I could give a shout out to Teresa Paul. She just recently had a chapter in a book that was published and um, I will share the link in the show notes. Also wanted to give a shout out to Jeff Nelligan. We had an interview earlier this week about parenting and the trauma that kids had from the pandemic. And he wrote a couple books about it. And it's really interesting. A parent's guide to restoring their family. So go check that out if you have a chance to do so. So grateful for the one in 36 mix virtual autism summit in that Um, event, we were able to make enough proceeds that I have gone and started a nonprofit. More to come on that. But for now, enjoy the show. Thanks for joining the SJ Child show today. Today, I'm really excited to start this conversation with this guest. I think that so many of us um, and the listeners uh, have a child who has a special exceptions or has skills that, you know, sometimes we don't know how to best help those children. And today I'm excited to bring this guest who um, has started his own companies, his own services for just that purpose. And we'll find out more as we dive into this conversation. So without further ado, thank you so much for being here today. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us an introduction and kind of what started this journey for you. Um, Well, it started probably pretty early on. Um, I grew up in uh, Canada with immigrant parents who were, you know, uh, very hardworking and more blue collar. And um, I kind of went through school fairly easily. And... But what I didn't realize at the time is I was struggling with a little ADD, um, also some depression, uh, things like that, and kind of, you know, pretty much my first got through high school, no problem, and then hit college, and I just didn't have the tools and equipment um, to really apply myself in a sense. I was kind of lost in it and almost flunked out my first attempt. Um, but managed to get through and, uh, and then as <clears throat> I had, uh, my own, my own first son, it was apparent that he was a little, yeah, a little different, you know, but you don't really see that in your own kids, but he was extremely alert as a, as a young child. Um, you know, just, we called him baby no sleep cause he just was soaking <laughs> up so much information all the time and he was he was kind of a leader in our neighborhood with all the kids except that he was so had so much so such heavy interests in certain topics mm-hmm. and areas that you know when the kids were with him on his thing it was fine but as soon as they got tired of it he just kept going he did his own thing and he you know and everyone else just kind of melted away so to speak um we later Started him in kindergarten, and he did. He really struggled in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. All the other kids are getting their stars, and he wasn't getting his, his stars. And um, you know, and in the meantime, I was in the field of uh, gifted and talented as a resource teacher. Um, and it's it's weird because you don't see it in your own kid, which is really strange. <laughs> but, um, later, we found out he was diagnosed right around six with uh, Asperger's, now ASD. And um, for the most part, school was a real tough battle and struggle for him mm. pretty much all the way through. And he was, he's a brilliant young man now, um, but still struggles with social and emotional issues and uh, um, just the kindest 
you know, kid you ever want to meet. But again, he had trouble, you know, in social situations. He had trouble in schools in terms of uh, going into himself. And uh, yeah, so we actually ended up pulling him in ninth grade and he ended up basically homeschooling and doing his GED. And now he's in college and, you know, 4.0, maybe. You, I mean, he's doing what he wants to do and it's just blossoming now. Yeah. But, you know, we didn't, there wasn't a lot known about twice exceptionality back in the, in the 90s. It was there, but it wasn't a, you know, a huge thing. And now after a, few, a couple more kids, you know, we end up with three children that would be labeled as having dual diagnoses or more. Um, but they're all very different. Mm. So that kind of led me into the field. And uh, I've been a, a teacher, administrator, uh, school principal, uh, uh, executive director for SANG, an organization, SANG, mm -hmm. uh, supporting the emotional needs of gifted. I was their ED for a while. And now we're started up a, a new company called Gifted and Thriving. And I mostly work and coach with uh, with families around the world. Um, but we also do school trainings and uh, things like that. So, yeah, that's where we are today. But my interest was probably, you know, my own educational experience was up and down. Um, too easy. And then sometimes just, you know, emotionally it was, it was difficult. Um, the material never was that difficult. So it was just balancing that and finding my own metacognitive journey of who I was took a long, long time. Yeah. And uh, so we're finally getting to a point, you know, of give, trying to give back a little bit and, and of course, running this company as well. So oh, that's fantastic. It's so amazing when you see the um, connection you can make in the community, when you can find like, families that you can mm -hmm. talk to and connect with. It's so hard. It's so isolating when you have a child with needs that are unlike their peers with interests that are so far beyond their peers ideas of, of what is, are things to do. So, um, yeah, I can resonate with that. Definitely. When did you decide to, um, well, I guess when you decided to pull him out for homeschool and, and do that, what kind of systems did you guys, did you find an online school or do it yourself? I mean, you're obviously very educated, so it wasn't something beyond you to do. Well, at that time I was, I was working full time as a head of school. Um, so my wife kind of took it on mm -hmm. and we pretty much unschooled. Yeah. Um, we didn't have a full system in place. And actually, the almost the exact same time, uh, my daughter, who was in seventh grade, uh, was having lots of issues, uh, real high sensory processing stuff and depression and anxiety. And so we pulled her at the same time. Um, and so the both of them kind of did some online schooling for a while. That didn't work out so well. And so we kind of allowed them to chart their own course both of them and both of them ended up finishing off with a GED um, and just they've taken the pressure away of, of, you know, having to conform to a system that wasn't working for them um, was a real, almost an instant relief for them. Yeah. Now it wasn't all, you know, peaches and cream in a sense, there was certainly rough days and tough times, but we found that, you know, when I started working with them on their GED stuff, um, Amanda just whipped through it all so easily. I just, you know, and Sean it really struggled because he he had also a, a language uh, disorder. Um, so for him, reading was was tough and writing was tough. And um, but he got through mm -hmm. and finished it and took a little extra work. But um, the bottom line is it was the path of least resistance for us. Yeah. Um, and we had moved quite literally one, two, at least four school districts trying to find the right fit Wow! in three different states. And, uh, yeah. Some that's rough states. too. Yeah. yeah. That takes a toll on the whole family. It does. Uh, cause you're removing them from their environments where they finally felt like there was something going on, but then we knew the school system wasn't going to meet their needs. Yeah. So we had them up and move and yeah, started in Minnesota, ended up in 
finishing up in North Carolina. So, um, how did that make you feel as an educator yourself, not being able to find the right place for your child? Well, it's it's a motivator in one sense mm. um, because it, it, you know, that's a lot of my teacher training models and modules and programs are right around, you know, based on how do we reach kids that aren't the norm? Yeah. And how do we reach our kids that are well above the norm? How do we reach our kids that are, are smart but have some learning difficulties? How do we reach our kids that just don't fit that box? Um, so that's the basis in a sense for all the training. It's almost, and it's the basis for what we do with Gifted and Thriving is working with families and schools to really try to open up, you know, the gates in a sense to understanding from a neuro diverse perspective, what's going on with these kids and how to reach them. Um, because the system isn't designed for the outlier. Yeah. And, um, and so you have to really dig in. And you have to get the training. You have to commit if you want to reach all your students. And that's why we teach is yeah. we want to make sure all of our kids are getting from A to B to C, um, not just the ones that fit the profile in terms of a standard. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a motivator in a sense. It's also opens your eyes in a sense to really the lack of foundational training around the needs of these kids. Um, when I went through my, my teacher education program, I think I had one hour of, of gifted training, zero of twice or multi-exceptional training um, in the entire three years. And so you think about that, and we were bringing our teachers in, our new teachers that just aren't prepared for yeah. the differences that are going to come in their classroom, and that's across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we need to do a better job in terms of really putting together trainings and uh, staff development around reaching those outliers mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they're in your classroom and you're going to have them and the numbers are rising. Absolutely. So, um, you have to be ready. You know, a couple of things came to mind. Um, one in 36, right? You know, now are the numbers of children with autism in the United States. What percentage of that are twice exceptional? Do you know um, statistics on that by chance? No, we don't have the statistics because mm -hmm. uh, twice exceptional children are underdiagnosed probably by, I would guess, more than 50%. Um, and usually just in the school system is what I'm coming to find out and learn more about that. It's mm -hmm. usually that it's mostly just like an, an educator tool, if you will, rather than the actual like life diag like diet, then it's not a diagnosis then. No. So that's so interesting. Well, when you think about twice exceptionality, you're thinking about kids that are actually very, very bright. Um, and they know how to accommodate. They know how to camouflage because kids don't want to stand out. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they will they will learn to accommodate themselves until it gets to be too much. And then we start to see breakdowns, uh, especially emotionally, behaviorally. And and so suddenly they become emotional and behavioral issues rather than really cutting to the what's the root of the issue here? What's the root of what's going on? If my needs are not being met for so long, yes, eventually I'm going to get to a point of stress and frustration. Um, and I may act out or I may continue to camouflage and go deeper inside. Interesting. Um, so that's one of the issues. Um, we have very little training in terms of spotting what you might consider twice exceptionality or multiple exceptionality. Um, and again, the kids appear to do OK. Their, their work and their scores remain average to above average. So we don't always recognize that there's a deficit going on. It's really about peeling back the onion and really digging deeper in terms of, right, I'm seeing flashes of brilliance here, and yet there's something that's in the way. Something's going on. Something's missing. But once again, when in a system where you have 25 to 30 kids in a classroom, sometimes even at elementary, um, I've seen, you know, 25 to 30 kids in a yeah. classroom. How much time do you actually have to really dig in? Um, so... You know, the, yeah. it's it's part of the system as well. It's part of the lack of training. And then when we go into the rural communities, when we go into minority communities, uh, I mean, they're, they're just treading water in a sense. So yeah. those are entire populations that we're missing as well. 
So wow. the numbers are really, you know, uh, I don't think they're accurate in any form. Yeah. But we don't have the proper identification tools. Okay. And uh, so these kids are in your schools. Um, many are actually, if, you know, if the parents can, are pulling kids out and homeschooling. Um, the epidemic didn't help either in that mm. sense. Um, so in, in essence, I think we're lose, we're missing out on an entire generation here of, of yeah. kids. Um, I mean, I look at, I always go back to my son, Sean, but I mean, he's, he's been a cryptozoologist since he was three years old mm. and knows, you know, back then certain areas like dinosaurs and, and Sasquatch and astronomy and, and for whatever reason, biblical prophecy, he had like many PhDs <laughs> and would go so in depth, but yeah. he was mostly self-taught. Yeah. And so we have a lot of these kids running around um, that are, you know, where the school system isn't doing. They can't measure that you know, level of intelligence that they no, have. Yeah. They really can't because they're forced to uh, adhere to standards. Yeah. Right. And then there's those standards are tested upon and then tests go into the papers. So it's all about achievement and it's all about, you know, is my school performing versus are my individual kids meeting their potential? Yeah. And that can become an issue because it's turning into a factory uh, rather than a way to really grow our kids and, and so that they reach their maximum potential, yeah. regardless of whether they're two year gifted or special needs or whatever they are. Exactly. Um, so we really do have to take a, a, a good look at the system as a whole. Um, and the problem is it's, you know, it's not cheap to educate mm. individuals. Yeah. So it just isn't. So, and whenever there's money involved, um, yeah, you're going to see uh, disparities. and Ideals gaps. change. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Right. How did the schools, um, you said you're working with some schools, what is their outlook? Kind of what's their take on it? Are they willing to get the the training? Well, it, what has that been looking like? Well, it depends on the school system once again. Mm -hmm. And who's. it's really about leadership mm -hmm. in terms of what the leadership sees as needs. Um, and again, you're competing for dollars. So what takes priority? So in many cases, it's technology that will take priority. You know, what is, what, how are you, you know, what are you prioritizing in terms of your teachers and what they need to know? So in most cases, the last few schools I've been working with are more private schools yeah. um, or, or charter <clears throat> schools or um, before the pandemic, I was I was uh, I was at Reno, you know, the public school system in Reno and one in Arizona and a couple in L.A. Um, and a few others across the country. But that after the pandemic, that is kind of, you know, has gone away a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still a lot of. Uh, specialized schools out there yeah. across the country. And so that's been more of uh, the folks that have been reaching out because they're seeing in their populations increasing, especially in this, what we would call twice exceptional world. Again, that's a misnomer because uh, it really is about multiple exceptionalities. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. And some people even, you know, get bent out of shape about that. So <laughs> I always say dueling diagnoses because, you know, what's going on in the person, you know, what do we have here? Do we have gaps in learning. Do we have discrepancies in terms of their profile, things like that. So it's very complex, definitely very complex. very complex. And you have to um, be very sensitive about the needs of the individual, of the families, of the everyone mm -hmm. around. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. good that you take those things into consideration. That's for sure. Yeah. What would you say as far as like in your moving about, did you find a good school district? <laughs> the people want to know where should uh, we go? <laughs> well, the one school district where I was actually working at the time was called Minnetonka Public Schools. And, and I ran across so many wonderful teachers there. Um, it was that school that I actually went to the board with an idea of a separate magnet school um, called the navigator program and that's up and running and still going for uh, highly gifted and twice exceptional kids and they're i guess it's still going pretty well it's been quite a while now is that there in washington or no that is in minneapolis it's oh wow okay suburbs uh, west suburbs of minneapolis 
And as far as I know, um, you know, we, we drastically changed the program, made it much more mm -hmm. comprehensive. And so we had people moving from all over and driving from all over to have our kids attend. Because again, there's a great need there. Yeah. Um, when we got to the Carolinas, we were first in South Carolina. Um, and it was a rural district, more kind of rural slash suburban. Um, again, it was really about individuals rather than about the system. And so the middle school there was wonderful for our kids. Mm. Um, but the high school was was pretty much horrific. Mm. Um, so we ended up moving again to another district in uh, near Wellington, uh, North Carolina. And again, we ran into some very, very wonderful people in terms of the counselors who um, at that point we only had one one of our kids in, in the school. And that was my second son, Alex, who had extreme anxiety issues. But mm -hmm. they they really bent over backwards to work with him. And he did manage to graduate um, through the system there. But again, it's really it's hard because it's few and far between. And so you're almost looking for to find the right allies in the system that will are willing to help and work with your with your kids and, and be their allies and mentors um, rather than the whole system itself, because it's yeah. pretty rare to find a good school district um, that really looks after the needs of these kids. Uh, a few that come to mind, I know Paradise Valley in Phoenix uh, has done a bunch of really great stuff because my former colleague of mine, uh, Dina Brolis, has retired from there now, but really built a nice program there. Um, so there are programs you just have to really dive deep yeah. and see. Um, I did write a piece for parents quite a few years ago in terms of what to look for when you're looking for school districts, mm -hmm. uh, what questions to ask, what about, you know, the pedagogy, the curriculum, the people, the system, uh, the whole works, but what kind of testing they do, what kind of uh, screenings they do and things like that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of gifted programs across this country are more achievement based programs, mm. um, which is really not that's really not truly gifted. It's not a bad thing, um, but it's that's not really what we call gifted programs. A lot of our yeah. gifted folks just kind of lose interest in school and um, and are always what we call achievers. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you have to you got to dig in and you got to do your homework and. You know, there's communities around everywhere. There's resources. I think most states have, have have different organizations and support, parent organizations, teacher organizations. So you can, if you dig, find uh, a few places out there. Yeah. And of course, then there's there's private schools as well. And again, not everyone can afford that kind of education. Um, but I think if you look hard enough, you'd be able to find, you know, in most states and most bigger cities at least one or two places where your, your child might fit yeah. um but again it's 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 hard to do um, yeah. like i said we moved so many times just trying to find something that would fit our with our ch children and it didn't work yeah oh, it's devastating for families to have to do that chase things mm -hmm. to try to find things that work out for their families isn't that um you know, we're kind of in that same boat where we're at a standstill and not mm -hmm. sure what our next move is. So maybe I look into Phoenix since that's not too far away. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think that, yeah, when we can have these resources available to families, I mean, that's exactly why we're here today is to, you know, get them that information. What yeah. would you say are maybe some signs, if you will, for parents that are just on this journey or don't even know that they might have a gifted child, uh, what are some things that stand out that might they might be able to identify with? Well, I mean, the list is long <laughs> and it really depends on what exactly you're looking for. If you're looking at just bright kids, you're looking at alertness, early alertness, you're looking at you know, uh, they seem to have these big eyes. They just seem to have taken the entire world. Um, you're looking at language development, but not always. You know, there's there, there's the Einstein syndrome too, where we have kids that won't talk and then suddenly are speaking sentences. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our son was a bit like that, more of a perfectionist. He, I don't think he wanted to talk until he 
knew he could do it properly. Hmm. Right. So you're looking at uh, lots of different things. You're looking at um, how they how they can problem solve early, how they can investigate the questions they have, the interests they have, um, the curiosity, the I mean, there's just such a, a fine a list. But then again, when they're that young, it's really difficult to say this is it and this is not because yeah. our, the type of assessments we do uh, very early are not as, as accurate as if they were a little bit more mature. Um, but if you suspect something is different, if they're picking things up really quickly, um, you know, get resources, get help. Uh, go to, there's a website called Hoagies Gifted, the Sandwich Gifted. That has a ton of resources, not super well organized, but you can find what you want there with lots of different articles and books and mm. things. And uh, so, again, I don't really care for checklists because they're very prescriptive um, and they don't really deal into the roots. But again, you can try those things. If your kids seem developmentally different than their peers around them, that's another clue. I mean, that's what we had with Sean right off the bat. Just a very, you know, very different kid. Yeah. Um, we kind of stood out. And again, metaphysically, uh, the kids are different. They're bringing in more sensory information um, at a more rapid pace. Um, and so they have more sensitivity. So looking for things like uh, those early sensitivities, if they're, if loud noises scare them, if, if certain light and, and, you know, that range of emotions that continues to happen. Um, so there's little clues that you're looking for. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, mm-hmm. but I think as a parent, instinctively, you will know if something's a little different or a little off. It's harder for Twice Exceptional because, again, the masking type behaviors, mm-hmm. I don't think they actually <clears throat> start right off the bat. I think there needs to be a catalyst for that, and usually at school. Mm. Um, even in preschool, you can, you know, um, you can start to see differences. I, I still remember back and when I went to preschool and we had to do nap time, um, and sorry, I wasn't tired. <laughs> You're right. Why should I sleep? Yeah. So I'm, and I'm looking at the ceiling and counting and doing all kinds of stuff rather than sleeping. And quite honestly, in many cases, our, our kids don't, uh, don't need as much sleep as their peers. Yeah. Uh, don't don't take that across the board, but it, yeah. it's, it's out there. There's a higher energy. There's something we call hyper body, hyper brain. Hmm. Uh, so a more intensive energy, also mental energy, but also sometimes physical energy. Um, I just did a webinar last night on on gifted ADD or both. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 fascinating stuff. Um, but I think is, parent, is there a link we can go check it out or was it just a live? No, uh, yeah. well, I think you can give that to probably, me later. <laughs> yeah, probably we have uh, probably uh, 15 to 20 webinars up on the site Wow, at, or more Great um, on a lot of different topics. And Wonderful. I think they're like 30 bucks or something like that. Perfect. Um, we have some trainings, we have uh, workshops, we have a bunch of stuff, but Again, if you're really curious about this, um, you will. You can. There's plenty of information out there. Yeah. Um, but again, it's there's nothing quite like the parental instinct in terms of understanding. Hey, something's something's different here. Yeah. And then, you know, not ignoring it, but going and checking it out, Love and that. making sure that uh, you know you find out what's going on. Because the earlier you diagnose, the better off your child will be. Oh, absolutely. And I think I. I hope that now I think society is, is being more, um, understanding of that. They're having more grace, you know, not being Mm -hmm. so worried about the stigma of, of a label or a diagnosis. It's, you are going to get the services and the support you need with the Mm -hmm. diagnosis. So please seek those out. If you have those kinds of questions, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm, I have, if you don't mind, I just have this cute preschool story about DJ. I love that you made me think of when you said the preschool story, because I think one of the ones that were for us when he was in his, um, you know, I think he was two and a half or something. He was like the pre preschool class and he, uh, they, 
we're doing the alphabet. And when it came to the letter K, he said potassium and raised his little hand. Mm -hmm. And they just, (laughs) the teachers were just knocked on the floor. You know, they're like, how does this kid know potassium? Um, And so I I love that. And it was such an interesting marker of where he was at, you know, at three years old. Um, And from then, you know, it was just kind of like, what, how much more can we uh, teach him? Like what tools can we give him? And then, you know, it's endless from then on, but there yeah. was, I loved that, that little potential. Oh, it's the same, <laughs> you know, the same thing. If you're in, if you have a child in kindergarten, that's already reading chapter books and they're trying to sound out letters. That's not a right fit. Yeah. Yeah, right? absolutely. And that child will figure out pretty quickly that this school system doesn't have much to offer me. Yeah, that um, is the truth. So those are the things you look for is the, some of those type of stories, the, you know, and, uh, and in the opposite too, in terms of, you know, with Sean having Asperger's, we could definitely notice differences in his, in his play yeah, and his behavior with other kids, a lot more parallel play than you would expect, a lot less interactive play. Yeah. Um, so things like that. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and our second son, I knew he was a perfectionist. When he put her on skates for the first time at age three and started skating, he was very athletic. Um, and then he fell once and basically was yelling at the top of his lungs that he was never going to be good enough. I mean, first time you put on skates and you're skating, that's not the most <laughs> right. Good thing. Right. Um, oh, and I was like, oh, no, true. here we go. <laughs> perfectionism no I isn't that the truth I do I have a child exact same thing too athletic and everything she does she picks up the first time and then it's like devastation if something goes wrong with it Mm -hmm. um but you you teach them that hey you keep trying all of the things because you are good at all of the things (laughs) well and, and that's another lesson for our school system in a sense is that failure is a good thing yeah you know, we, we a lot of we, lessons. We live in a in a in a in a system where everything's about getting A's and and doing great and you know blah blah blah. But it's you know you don't learn unless you screw it up. Oh, that is so true. And so oh, we I really like got to we stigmatize failure, but we really should be embracing that and having our kids, you know, no matter what level they are, you know, treading water a little bit and maybe even dipping below the wave sometimes. Yeah. You know, so that they do our challenge and they do struggle a little bit. Those yeah. are good lessons. Absolutely. Um, we just don't do it enough. <laughs> More character learning, huh? <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming to chat with me today and really having this explorative conversation about um, twice exceptionalities and just different, you know, exceptionalities. Tell us your website and places we can go to find and support you. Um, well, our website is called very simply gifted and thriving.com. So you can go there. There's a, you can sign up for the newsletter and we also have a free parent guide for twice exceptionality. I think it's five or six pages alone, but I put together, it's just an introduction, um, kind of a, you know, uh, kind of a little manual kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's there. Um, and then of course we have quite a few webinars we got some workshops, um, we're going to be launching a, um, a monthly membership club that's going to include a bunch of stuff at some point in the near future. Um, but yeah, we're just, you know, we, uh, I work with a lot of families across the world, um, in terms of not just, you know, the, the kids and their struggles, but I, you know, I work with the entire family because you have to, everyone's affected when you're, when you're working with, with uh, kids or students or even even adults. Um, so we have that, we have those services and, uh, yeah. So we do a lot of coaching and, uh, but yeah, gifted and thriving.com and the email would be support at gifted and thriving.com. Wonderful. So if anyone's interested, we, uh, we try to answer as, you know, our emails as quickly as possible. Uh, but I usually like to use the 24 hour rule. If I don't answer in 24 hours and it's on me, <laughs> that's Unless nice right right you gotta give us a weekend yeah. break yeah absolutely oh it's been such a pleasure to talk to you today and i really appreciate 
um, the work that you're doing and the, the services you're providing to important families out there that, you know, are having a more difficult time finding what they need for their less typical child. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you.